Got him. Bolt cutters. Coming through, coming through, coming through, coming through, coming through. Hey. find your outdoors. I'm your host Frank Willem and this week we're joined by black belt taekwondo expert and student of the day in third grade Brittany Willem. <laughs> Thanks. This week we catch up with Dr. Marcus Dryman from the Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant Consortium. Marcus is a marine fisheries ecologist and his research interests are in applied fisheries ecology. The bulk of his research however has focused on coastal sharks. He works on many commercially and recreationally important species, including red snapper, red drum, gray triggerfish, greater amberjack, and even more. He's led a shark monitoring program in the northern Gulf of Mexico for over 10 years. During that time, he's, the program has captured, tagged, and released over 10,000 sharks. What? That's a bunch of sharks. Okay. Let's go join Marcus right now and see what they're up to. So this bottom long line is what we call a standard, standardized bottom long line. And what that means is that it's a gear type that's used by the National Marine Fisheries Service, or NOAA Fisheries. Uh, and they've been using this gear type since 1995. And so that we can compare what we catch to what they catch, we make sure to do the exact same thing that they do. So we set one nautical mile of monofilament, and that's what we call the main line. That was the monofilament that goes out off the stern of the boat. And then from that one nautical mile of monofilament, we hang 100 gangens. And the gangen is just the long piece of monofilament with a hook on the end. So we snap that hook onto the main line that sits in the water uh, for exactly one hour and then we retrieve it. Uh, once we retrieve it, uh, we're interested in doing a couple things. First and foremost, we're interested in simply recording exactly what we catch. That's a fish, boys! I got it! The most common shark that we catch, um, as well as the most common shark in the Gulf of Mexico, is called the Atlantic Sharp Nose Shark. Okay, up. Female, sharp nose. I'm good. 740-790-930-941. And when we catch those, we like to put these tags uh, in their dorsal fin. This is called a roto tag. We make a small hole in the dorsal fin and we stick this tag in the dorsal fin. That way, if the shark is ever recaptured, there's a phone number or a website actually on this tag um, and so an angler that recaptures one of those sharks can go to this website, enter the recapture information, and that gives us a lot of valuable information about sharp nose sharks. Got it. Ooh, feisty one. Oh, Ready? my goodness. On three. One, two, three, up. I'm ready. Mature male black nose. 780-860-1010-1067. Going in for a tag. Got it. Got it. 6.3. On three. One, two, three, up. Female sharp nose. I'm ready. 767-830-970-1000. Roto tag. Tag. 
tag number 0010. So I'm one of the chief scientists for the bottom long line um, survey that we've been doing. So my main responsibilities are preparing and organizing the gear, the cruise plans, um, you know, prepping the, the team and uh, helping keep all the data straight and collecting all the samples that we need. Uh, I started working with Dr. Dryman in 2015, so this is my fourth year um, working on this project. Oh, man, that's a big one. Got it. Take it around the stern, Em. Got it. Got it. All right, on three, one, two, three. Okay, I got it. On three, one, two, three. Up. I'm ready. This is a mature male black nose. Good. 845-925-1100. So we caught a lot of large red snapper. Snapper! And our theory is that when the fish get that big and that old, that they roam off of the structures where they are contained as smaller and younger fish, um, and then they become susceptible, so to speak, to our bottom long line gear. So by sampling with that bottom long line, we're able to capture those older and larger red snapper, which are a really valuable component of the population. Snap, snap, snapperoo! Something going on, boys. Oh, oh, Snapperoo, I see it. That's a snap. Snappity. Snapper. Something going on, boys. Snapper. Big fish. Yeah, that's good. So that's three snapper, Katya. So the concept is if we go out and do a repeated survey year in and year out and we do everything the exact same way, um, then we can look at changes in the fish population and attribute those changes to actual population level changes. But for certain fish, like red snapper, where we're particularly interested, in better understanding their population dynamics, we have to take parts of those fish. So for the red snapper, what we need specifically are things like their otoliths. Uh, the otolith is simply a, a bone in their head that records how old they are. So we catch that red snapper, we measure it, we weigh it, but then we sacrifice it so that we can remove those otoliths and determine how old the fish is because the age structure of a population is a very critical piece of data that informs the stock assessment. On Monday, we caught a lot of sandbar sharks, um, a handful of large um, individuals, both male and female, and that's a really interesting species um, of particular concern for us. So, these sharks are considered HMS, or highly migratory species. Uh, and in particular, the sandbar shark has historically been overfished. So as of 2010, that shark has been on a moratorium. So it is illegal to land um, either recreationally or commercially sandbar sharks. And so what our data have shown since 2010, we're now in 2018, so nearly 10 years later, if we look at the catch series for sandbar sharks, it appears as if their populations are starting to recover. Um, and we can attribute that to management actions taken by NOAA Fisheries to help protect that stock. So it really illustrates the value of a long-term standardized fishery independent monitoring program like our bottom long line program. So since 2010, we can look at the catches of sandbar shark and we see them slowly starting to increase and we take that as very good news. 
Got him. Nice spin. Boat cutters. Coming through, coming through, coming through, coming through, coming through. Ready? Watch your face, Emily. Watch your face. So we also caught uh, several scallop hammerheads. Scallop hammerheads are another highly migratory species of particular concern. Um, so there is evidence that suggests that their populations um, are not doing well. Uh, in addition to that, they suffer what we call high post-release mortality. So when they're captured on gears like bottom long line or recreational hook and line, um, there are species that physiologically can't cope with that capture stress as well as things like black tip sharks or sandbar sharks or tiger sharks, this for example. Cool so you'll notice when we captured those sharks, we were very quick to bring them on board very quickly, cut the hook out of the mouth as quickly as possible. We don't weigh them. We take the just the bare minimum amount of data necessary, the measurements, we put a tag in it, we get that fish back over and into the water as quickly as possible. And as you'll see, um, those sharks did fairly well. They seemed to swim right off very quickly and that was something that uh, we worked very hard to do. Right there. Um, Nine, one, five, one, zero, zero, zero. Yeah, I got it, I'll pop it out. M tag it quickly if you can. Now you'll also notice that for some of the sharks we caught, we used a different type of tag. Uh, this is called a, a dart tag or an M tag. Uh, these are made by a different company and you can see that they function in a different way. Uh, so the reason that we use these tags sometimes as opposed to these tags is we use these for larger sharks or sharks that are younger and that will be growing much larger because if a shark is already full grown, and has a relatively thin dorsal fin, then this kind of tag works really well. Um, if the shark still has a lot of growing to do and its fin is going to get broader um, and thicker, then these tags can pop out. So you could argue that this is a slightly more invasive tag. It's a big dart, so it's like getting an ear piercing. Um, and we stick this dart in the musculature of the shark. Uh, but again, for smaller sharks, we tend to use these smaller tags. Some of my master's work is looking at um, functional and species diversity of these sharks and large fish species across the northern Gulf of Mexico. So I took blood samples and I'm looking at, well, we, at um, stable isotopes for these plasma samples. So essentially it can give me um, some information on their dietary patterns without having to euthanize the animal. So all of those samples I collected off the bottom long line survey. So that's where I really got practice understanding and working with the gear as well as learning safe techniques to handle these animals and uh, to collect these samples without harming the, the individuals quickly and safely. Yep. Watch your face, Emily. Emily, watch your face. This project is ultimately it's funded by BP. So BP had money um, that they paid out as a settlement for the BP, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. That money went to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, NFWF, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. That organization, NIFWF um, is what we call that, uh, then dispersed that money to each individual state in the Gulf of Mexico and said, you, got, you states should spend this money how you see fit to better manage your marine resources so that next time we have an oil spill, we'll have the data to better assess what the effects of that spill were. In other words, um, use this data as each state sees fit. And so the state of Alabama has seen fit to use this data to help gather more baseline population level data um, about their marine resources, in particular things like these large old red snapper um, and populations of large and small coastal sharks. So. The money comes ultimately as a settlement from BP to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, then to the state of Alabama, and then to these various universities. So we are a partner with the University of South Alabama, and that's how we do this work. So if I had one chance to share with the public something that I've learned about sharks is that they aren't necessarily something, something to be feared, but they're actually incredibly amazing creatures that need our help. Um, their populations have been declining for decades globally, um, and a lot of that is, is reckless um, sacrificing or, or euthanasia of the animal. Um, they're, they're very important apex predators in the ecosystems. They, they serve a vital role um, for the health and the populations of our other fisheries that we want.
Hi, I'm David Crabtree, executive chef at Island View Casino in Gulfport. I'm also competing in the 2018 World Food Championship. I did uh, the seafood category last year and placed fourth, so today I'm working on some recipe development with uh, shark. All right, the fish of the day today is shark. It's a black tip shark. I've got a pretty big, big chunk, probably about five pounds here. Um, and what we're gonna do today is we're going to flay off a good piece. Shark's one of those fish that uh, 20 years ago, it was considered a trash fish and most people didn't use it. Um, but shortly after that, people started using it and it showed up in some fine dining restaurants. Uh, shark is one of those fish that has a lot of muscle. They're real tough, so you gotta treat it with some, uh, some, some, some chef tools. You gotta marinate it or pound it in order to get a good product out of it, typically. What we're gonna do is make a little marinade. We're gonna do a little lemon juice. A little uh, amber abita beer. You can use any beer for it that you want. I prefer the, the darker beers for something like this. A little hot sauce. And just a little bit of salt in your marinade. You notice the reaction of the uh, salt when I put it in there. It started breaking it down right away. Working. And we're gonna lay that uh, shark filet right inside that. I was camping when I used this recipe for the first time, and we only had a few products. Beer, of course, when you go camping, you gotta have beer. So uh, we had beer, my wife had lemon juice because she drinks tea with a lot of lemon juice, and we had salt. So basically it was those three ingredients originally. I really, it's kind of something that I discovered by accident, and I really liked the flavor of it. I really liked what the beer and the lemon juice and the salt broke down the fish. And uh, since I've done that first time, like I said, I've used it in restaurants and a few different menu preparations. Make a little egg wash. Got our, uh, just a couple eggs. A little cream. pan we're going to start with a little uh, clarified butter or oil. So we've got our egg wash, a little seasoned flour. We'll take our uh, black tick sharp filet into the egg wash, into your seasoned flour. And once your pan's hot enough, Put that in there and um, fresh shark is wonderful, frozen shark not so good. So when you get it, cook it, serve it, eat it. Now you can take the shark and you can you can pound it if you want to a little bit uh, to skip the marinade, just sort of treat it like sort of like veal. Pound it out a little bit so it's tender. So when you cook it, it's nice and uh, tender. They got a lot of muscle in them, so they do a lot of uh, you know chasing fish and eating fish. Um. As you're cooking it, you can tell uh, by the color of it and by the, the texture of it when you press into it, whether it's going to be cooked or not. It'll be sort of like a steak when you're touching a steak to see how, it, how it's cooked. Fish does the same thing. It, it tough, uh, firms up, so when it's not... Uh, soft anymore, it'll be done. A little heavy cream, bring it all together. We're gonna go ahead and take our fish out. It's cooked. Our oysters. And one of the last things you wanna to add to it is your crab meat. Just want to cook the oysters just till the oysters start to curl, which doesn't take long. And there's our penade black tip shark, oyster, crab meat, lemon caper sauce.